Hey, everybody. Is this on? It's perfect. I, can't, I can barely hear any feedback. This is great. Hello. <laughs> OK, so today I want to talk about um, kind of two things that are related, um, Houdini and polyfilling CSS. And I'm going to start with the polyfilling CSS part. To give a little bit of context for why I want to talk about this, I wrote an article for Smashing Magazine a little bit more than a year ago called uh, Houdini, maybe the most exciting development in CSS that you've never heard of. And in this article, I introduce Houdini, and I make this point that Houdini will enable some polyfilling capabilities that are you know, kind of desperately missing from CSS today. And I, you know, the same piece of um, feedback was popping up over and over again from some people commenting, and, and people were kind of asking or saying the same question. I don't understand what's so hard about polyfilling CSS. And it occurred to me that you know, I kind of wrote this in the article because I have worked on CSS polyfills in the past and I've experienced some of these challenges myself. And it occurred to me that if you have never done this, maybe you don't know why it's hard. And you know, of course, why, why would you if, you've, if you've never done it? So today I kind of want to answer this question, what is hard about polyfilling CSS? And I think it's easier to show than to tell how to do this. So I think the best way to really drill in this point, what's hard about it, is to just try writing a polyfill here today with, with all of you. So let's uh, go ahead and get started. So I was trying to think about what, what feature did I want to polyfill. And I didn't want to pick a real feature because I really, really don't want anyone to use this polyfill. I really don't use this when we're done. Uh, so I thought if I picked a fake feature, then it would decrease the chances of somebody using it, although I imagine it's still somewhat likely that somebody will, but please don't. Anyway, so we're going to polyfill this feature called random. It's a new CSS function, and all it is is it returns a number between 0 and 1, very similar to math.random in JavaScript. And so here's an example usage. You have a, a progress bar uh, element, and you give it a width, and since random um, returns a unitless number, you can use calc to give it a unit if you want. So in this case, we're doing calc, multiplying it by 100%, and this will give us a progress bar between 0 and 100% width. So to give an example of um, what this looks like, let's open up this demo. And here is just kind of a, a bootstrap starter template, and I've added four progress bars to the top of the subheadings um, because I think you know, they really make the site pop a lot more. And uh, as you can see, they're all kind of randomly filled out. And so once the this, this, these are just inline styles right now, um, hard coded. But once the polyfill is working, when I refresh the page, as I'm doing now, and you see nothing is changing, but when it's working, each one of these will have a random value every time. OK, so let's get started. But the question is, you know, if this feature doesn't exist in the browser, how do you go about telling the browser about the feature? You know, how, how do CSS polyfills kind of fundamentally work? Um, you know, in JavaScript, it's a lot more flexible. You have this kind of stuff where you can write if statements, and if a feature doesn't exist, you can assign a function to a native variable. And this is how polyfills work in JavaScript. It's very common. Uh, you can't really do this in CSS. You don't have this imperative capability. So what do you do? How do polyfills in CSS work? Well, fundamentally, all CSS polyfills, and I really do mean this, all polyfills today that, that are CSS polyfills kind of do the same basic thing. They turn code, um, they rewrite code that the browser doesn't understand into code that the browser does understand. So for example, you would have this calc random times 100% feature, and the browser doesn't understand that, it's just going to throw it away. But if you can rewrite it and pre-compute the random value beforehand, then you can give it to the browser, and now it has a value it understands, and it's going to use this value just fine. It's not going to throw it away. So this is the like, super basic overview of how all CSS polyfills work. So we know that we have to update the CSS, but the question then is where, where do we update it? So the kind of the first obvious place to look is the CSS object model. If you're not familiar with this, it's on document.stylesheets, and there's a bunch of different types of uh, objects, you know, style sheet lists, style sheets, and you have rules, and those rules have declarations and properties and values and, and everything. So I wrote a function that just traverses through document.stylesheets, and then it goes and creates like a list of rules and goes through each one of those rules and looks for, in the property declarations, um, the literal string random with the open and close parens, and then replaces it with the result of math.random. And so I thought, okay, this is, 
this should work. Um, so let's go ahead and copy this code and open up this demo page, and I'm going to paste it here in the console. And once it runs, our polyfill should be done. Okay, so that didn't work as expected. Let's see if we can figure out why. So if we use our dev tools, sorry about this, and kind of inspect this code here, here's this progress element and has this progress bar element inside. So we see the style there and it's crossed out, but it didn't replace it. And so let's kind of dig in a little bit deeper. Let's go to um, document.stylesheets. And so there's a list of three, and I just happen to know because I created this page that the style sheet, or the rule that I care about is in the third style sheet, this one at index.css here. So if we open this up and look at the rules, I know there's just one rule and it should be in there, and then I see this progress dash bar with the open and close curly braces with nothing inside of it. And so that should clue us into what happened here. Um, the reality is that this style is not, this, this declaration is not in the CSS object model, because the browser didn't understand it, and so it threw it out. And this makes sense if you think about it. Anyone that's used CSS kind of understands this behavior. And in general, this is a fantastic feature of CSS. It allows you to use things that don't work, and that don't, it doesn't crash in browsers that don't understand them. But for our cases here, it's really bad, because now we want to make this polyfill, we want to rewrite the CSS, but we can't rewrite it because the browser has already thrown it away by the time it gets to us. So we've got to think of a different plan. So if the CSS isn't in the CSS object model, then where is it? How do we get it to rewrite it? Well, the answer is it's not really anywhere other than in the original files that you used. So CSS can be in style tags, it can be in um, style external style sheets with a link element with a type, uh, a rel type of style sheet. And so we just have to literally fetch those resources and get the text. That's the only way that we can do it today. And so I wrote a function here that just does a document query selector all for these types of elements, and it just kind of maps over them. If it's an external file, it does a fetch and returns a promise that resolves to the response, and then it finally joins everything together. And so once we have this, we should be able to get our CSS text. So let's try this and see how this works. I'm just going to paste this code here, which assigns this function. And then I'm going to call the function, which returns a promise, and then I'm going to log the result. Okay, so here's the results of all of our CSS. You can see this is bootstrap, minified, all the CSS stuff. And then here at the very, very bottom, we have our styles that we care about. Is that big enough? Can people see that? Should I increase it a little bit? Okay. Anyway, so we have our styles there at the very bottom. So now we have our CSS text, and so we can kind of, you know, get started. But once we have the text, we, of course, have to parse it. Um, you could try writing, you know, just doing a regular expression, find and replace, if you want, but I highly recommend against that, especially if you do have to do any kind of manipulation of rules, move one rule before or after another rule. Um, you really don't want to be doing that. You really want to be parsing it. And you might be thinking to yourself, okay, so the browser has a CSS parser. Um, maybe the browser can help me with this. And again, you know, there's a lot of things that the browser is doing to get your CSS to you, and you might think, again, like I could, I could reuse this stuff, but no, the browser does not expose these features to you, so if you want to do it, you have to do it yourself. So we're going to parse the CSS text, and instead of writing a parser here, I'm just going to grab, you know, kind of an open source uh, CSS parser that we can use. Um, so in this case, we'll use PostCSS. I'm just familiar with it. I like it. There are plenty of alternatives. Um, and to understand what the parser does is it takes this style rule with, um, you know, that we have here, and it, and it transforms it into what's called an abstract syntax tree, which is just a fancy name for kind of a, 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 like a large nested object that has a node, and each node has child nodes, and those nodes have child nodes. And so you can see here, this is what the PostCSS AST looks like for the styles on the left. And the reason you have this AST is because it makes it easier to then traverse through this object and replace the bits of the CSS that you care about. So now that we have all of the, um, you know, parse CSS, uh, we want to kind of see what it looks like. And so this next demo kind of puts all these pieces together. We import post CSS, we import our git page styles helper function that I wrote, and when this runs, it should log the object. 
So we could look at it and we can kind of see, there it goes, there's all of these nodes here. And you can see each node is kind of a type. We have comments, we have rules. And you know, this is just all of our CSS. This is great. So let's you know, kind of see what we've done so far. Let's check in. Uh, up at this point, we've written a fair amount of code. I've been talking for a decent amount of time so far. Um, but we haven't done anything even remotely related to the polyfill that we're trying to write. And this is kind of you know, a big problem with CSS polyfills. You end up spending so much time on things that are unrelated to your actual task. Okay, but let's keep moving on. I think we can get this. So next steps. We have to loop through the style declarations in the AST. We have to look for declarations that contain uh, the random function. If we find it, we have to replace it. And once done, um, we have to then like, stringify this AST back into CSS and put it back in the document. So PostCSS has a nice plugin system, and so we can re just reuse that for this purposes. It has these like, walk rules and walk declarations helper functions. And so this code basically uh, does what I just described. It looks for um, declarations where the value includes random, and then it replaces this with the result of math.random. And then this code is just a helper function. And by the way, all of this code is going to be uh, on GitHub, so you, you can look at it afterwards if you want. You don't have to necessarily worry about following along. I've tried to highlight the parts that are important if you uh, don't want to read everything. The, this um, helper function replaces the existing style elements on the page with, and creates a new one with the result of like whatever CSS comes back from post-CSS. It just kills all of the existing style elements, creates a new element, sets the inner HTML to the new CSS, adds it to the page. And so once we have all of this put together, we should finally have a working random plugin. So let's take a look at the demo and see what we've got. OK, so let me refresh. Maybe that's just a fluke. Interesting. OK, so it's kind of working. It's not really what we wanted, but then now that I think about it, all we did was replace the class progress bar, the declaration, with a single random value. And so every element that matches that is going to get the same single random value. I should have been expecting this. I don't know why I wasn't. But this clearly isn't good enough. You, you wouldn't want it to be this way. You would want it to be you know, every single progress bar gets a different random value. And this is the way most CSS functions work. If you do calc on an element and say with 100% minus 50 pixels, you wouldn't want it to reply that same 100% to every element. You would expect it to apply to the individual element and use that element's 100%. So we have to update the polyfill to target individual elements. So there's a couple ways we can do this. I think all the options are bad, and we're going to try to pick the least bad of all the bad options. So option one is we add inline styles to every element matching the rule selector. OK, so in our plugin, we could do a query selector all for, you know, we have the selector, so we can kind of search through the document for these elements. And then we can just apply this random thing to the actual element as an inline style. So this should work, and uh, it appears it appears to be working, but you never know if something is working fully until you kind of try to break it. So let's see here if we can break this. So I have the, the CSS file open, and you know maybe, let's see, let's write a media query and then add the same rule after it to maybe have a different thing in a different context. So. Greater than 40 m's, we want the width to be 100%. And less than 40 m's, we want it to be random. So let's see what happens here. OK, that's interesting. So you can see for a split second, because this is transitioning, it starts out at 100%, and then it goes to random. So clearly, it's not respecting, you know, like if you understand how the CSS cascade works, you would know that, that this rule should override it. But it's not. And this makes sense if, you, if we inspect these styles, because we've added this as an inline style. And as you probably know, inline styles have a higher precedence in the cascade order than um, you know, page styles. And so this is a problem, because anyone using this polyfill, now these fundamental assumptions that they make about CSS and how it works and how the cascade works, this is breaking those fundamental assumptions. A lot of CSS polyfills do this. 
And it's, it's really not great. And there's a lot of people that you know, file bugs and they say, this doesn't work on my site. And the reason is for this exact reason, because these fundamental assumptions you make just don't, you know, don't apply here. So I don't want to do option one. Let's go on to do option two. So option two takes a different approach. We're still going to add inline styles, but first we're going to check the rest of the CSS for matching rules and then only replace the random function with a random number as inline style if it's the last matching rule. So wait, that won't work because we have to account for specificity. So we'll have to manually parse each selector and calculate its specificity. Then we can sort the matching rules in specificity order from low to high and only apply the declarations from the most specific selector. Okay. Well, and then there's media rules, so we'll have to manually check those and do like window.matchmedia to see if those match. And speaking of at rules, there's also at supports. Can't forget about that. And then last, we'll have to account for property inheritance. So for each element, we'll have to traverse up the DOM tree and inspect all of its ancestors to get the full list of computed properties. Oh, and sorry, one more thing. We'll also have to account for importance, which is calculated per declaration instead of per rule. So we'll have to maintain a separate mapping for that to figure out which declaration ultimately wins. And I feel like this is something the browser should be doing for us. And it turns out the browser already does this for us. This is just the cascade. This is what CSS is. And to avoid these problems, I'm actually going down this road where I'm thinking, maybe I could re-implement the entire cascade in JavaScript. <laughs> or let's just see what option three is. Like I said, these are all bad options, but I think option three is going to be a little bit better. So in this case, we could rewrite the selects, um, all of our style sheet uh, to rewrite the, the selectors that contain the random function in such a way that instead of one selector matching many elements, we do it so that we have many selectors that each only match one element. Then when we replace random, it doesn't matter because it only matches one element. So to show you what I mean by that, say we have this style sheet on the left. We already have a, uh, the selector P, and it ha uses the, the random function. So we could rewrite the style sheet to give each one of those paragraph elements a unique ID, and then when we run our plugin, it'll change the random function uniquely per element, and so this should work. But if you're paying attention, you'll see that I've still increased the specificity of these selectors, and so this foo selector at the end should override the p selector, but now it won't because I've added an attribute to these selectors. But we can work around this by also arbitrarily increasing the specificity of every single selector on the page by the same specificity that we increase the P selectors, like so, by applying the not pseudo class and passing in a class level selector. Of course, we have to pick a class that is guaranteed not to be in the page, so I just picked Z in this case. And this is like really hacky, but it actually does work pretty well because it lets us use the cascade that the browser gives us for free. We've rewritten all the selectors, but it doesn't change the cascade order, and so this, this kind of works. So, you know, real quickly, I'll go through this code. Um, it effectively does the same thing where it adds a unique um, attribute to every single element that matches the selector, and then it, um, it kind of replaces the selector in the style sheet for that, and then it, it adds more logic to um, insert new rules, or sorry, insert additional add-on selectors, this, um, this, this not pseudo class selector, and passing in the Z class to that. You can go through this logic, uh, again, at your own pace if you want to. I, I just want to skim through it here. Um, so then we have the final code, which is the same code as before, but we've updated the plugin. So let's, let's check out this demo here. OK. So it appears to be working. Let's go back here and try this. So this is um, a, a different demo file. So that was in demo 6. Let's go to demo 7, and let's add the same code and refresh the page. So this is what we'd expect, because it's greater than 40 amps. And then if we lower it, you know, it, that seems to be working. OK. And again, this is working because we're just letting the cascade do its thing. So let's try a couple more things. You know, maybe we could um, do a random opacity. Could be fun. And maybe a random background color. Uh, we could, you know, do a random uh, hue times 360. Oops. 
and then 50% saturation, 50% lightness. See how that goes. Okay, so that's kind of working. I've always wanted to have randomly colored and transparent and completed progress bars. But I don't think we should stop there. I think we should try doing a couple more things. I think every site, oops, every site really needs random font size. <laughs> and since this is on the universal selector, we'll have to do important. So I think the design here is coming along quite nicely. Um, anyway, so there's the polyfill. It it's, appears to be working. And you know, you might think, oh, you've solved CSS polyfilling. Everything is great. Use this technique everywhere. And again, I said these are the three all bad options, and this is the least bad of the three options. Um, you know, it was super hacky. We rewrote the entire style sheet. Um, you know, there's a bunch of unresolved issues still. We didn't solve everything. We didn't handle issues where the DOM updates, you know, um, a new style element was added to the page, new um, DOM elements were added to the page. We didn't handle any of that at all. We didn't handle the case where an element has inline styles. We didn't handle the case where there's shadow DOM, and the shadow DOM has its own styles. We could do these things. We just didn't, it's just not enough time here. Um, there are unavoidable problems with this approach. It requires a ton of extra code. I pulled in all of PostCSS, which is like a meg of JavaScript, not you know, really production ready. Um, it doesn't work with cross-origin style sheets. If you, know, you had Bootstrap hosted on a CDN, it just wouldn't work at all. And this performs really poorly if the polyfill in question needs to be updated frequently. Like imagine a position sticky polyfill where on scroll you needed to be rewriting all the selectors all the time and matching them to DOM elements. I mean, this just would, it just doesn't quite scale at all. And to understand why it doesn't scale, think about, you know, this diagram outlines the browser's rendering pipeline. So you start out with the parser. The page requests HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and the, the browser parses it and creates this DOM and CSS object model. And then it does a cascade step, and then it does layout and paint and a compositing step. And then finally, you see pixels on the screen. And the key here, I don't know if it's how visible it is, but the dark, darker orange shows where you kind of have full JavaScript access. The lighter orange shows where you have partial access, which is the CSS object model. And this gray here, basically these other steps, you have pretty much no access at all to any of these steps. And so when you're doing a JavaScript polyfill, you have to let the browser do its whole render phase. And then you have to kind of go back and re-give it new stuff so that it can reparse it and you know, re-cascade, re-layout, repaint, recomposite. And this is just a huge waste. It, it, doesn't, it shouldn't be this way, but it kind of shows why, the, given the current state of things, CSS polyfills are just never going to be as performant as they, as they should be for kind of real serious production use. So what's the solution? And here's where we get to the second part of the talk. You know, I argue Houdini is, is going to do a lot of great things, but I argue Houdini in particular is going to be a great solution to this problem of CSS polyfilling. Houdini is a set of low-level APIs that give developers hooks into the browser's styling and layout mechanisms. And so with Houdini, this is in theory what the picture will be like, where you have JavaScript access to all of these steps in the rendering pipeline. So instead of having to go back through and do the loop over again, you could you know, modify maybe how the layout phase works or how the paint phase works or how the parsing works. So again, um, I'll just touch on a couple of new features of Houdini. Uh, Tab's giving a talk tomorrow where he's going to go a little bit more in depth on some of these features. So definitely uh, make sure you go to that as well. Um, with Houdini, that you have a new paint function that you can use in CSS. You have a new layout function that you can use in CSS. You have more powerful custom properties. You have a kind of revamped, better object model that's typed. And a lot of new things. So just to kind of give you some specific examples of these, some visuals, here's an example style sheet that uses some of these new Houdini APIs. You have this um, foo element that has a background image, and you call this paint function, and you pass it this identifier called circle, and that tells you know, the paint function what to do. And so you might wonder what circle is. Well, circle is something that we've added down here, um, and we've imported into the paint worklet. 
And it's a JavaScript file that we define that we basically say this is how you, we're going to draw a circle and we tell the browser how to draw the circle and then it, it will work. And so you can do similar things with um, the layout method um, or the layout function and maybe you want to do masonry layout or something like that. So here's an example of what the worklet code looks like for circle. So you register paint and you just pass the name and that you know kind of goes back to this name over here. That's how you know what to pass. And then you give it a class and you implement a couple of methods. And the most important method you have to implement is this paint method, which you um, receive as arguments the a co a context, which is similar to a, a canvas context in HTML. You s receive the geometry of the element, basically its width and height. And then you receive um, these properties, which just happen to be the, the same thing that you get when you say this input properties method. And effectively, that is any property that should require a redraw of the circle you know, like whenever this custom property circle color changes, you want the browser to redraw it, and so then the browser knows by specifying which properties it should pay attention to. You wouldn't want to redraw when any property changes. So let's take a look at this demo. So by the way, this is running in uh, Chrome Canary right now. This is a real demo. It's not like a um, custom version of Chrome or anything. So this is available today for you guys to try out. You just have to turn on the web platform features flag. So this is a text area that's drawing a circle in the background, and you can resize it. Um, and because this is CSS, I can go into DevTools and I can inspect this. I can click on this thing and I can change it and it redraws it. I didn't do anything special here. The browser just knows that when this value of this custom property changes to redraw the circle. And so that's how this works. And you might be thinking, okay, but like we could do circles in CSS for a while now. Uh, what do we need, who do you need to do that for? And so stay with me for a second. I'm going to take the same exact example, but I'm going to tweak it a little bit, add some additional properties. So instead of just customizing the color, we could customize the X and Y coordinates and the radius, so the size of the circle. And I've just, everything here highlighted in yellow, I've just changed from the previous example. It's, it's the exact same code, except for now we're getting these values from the custom properties. And in addition to these properties, let's, um, Let's transition them when a class gets added. So in this case, we have a button, and when the animating class is added to the button, we're going to transition the circle radius and the circle color properties over one second. And since it's CSS and this is a transition, we can kind of specify whatever easing function we want to use. And then we're going to add that class when the button is clicked. So literally, the code that I just showed you is all the code for this demo. When the button gets clicked, they just add the class animating, and I set the style values of X and Y just to the event coordinates, like the mouse offset. So let's take a look at this demo. So you might recognize this from like material design, but this is literally the same exact code I showed before. Um, and this is great because this is, this is the perfect use case for uh, the paint function because it's just this purely decorative effect like material design components right now have like seven or 50, I don't really know, DOM elements that kind of do this circle expanding thing. Um, and it doesn't make any sense. There's no reason this should be a DOM element. This is just an effect. It should be a circle, you know, expanding on a canvas. So this is a perfect use case for that. And again, because this is just CSS, I can inspect this. I can, you know, change these colors in the inspector. Uh, you know, maybe I have this kind of start color, it's this uh, half transparent white, but I could change it to, I don't know, is this going to let me edit it? There we go. Maybe uh, a red color. You know, and like I didn't change the code at all, I just changed the CSS because it's using the custom properties. And. If you've tried animating custom properties before, you might have found that it didn't work. And uh, so I was being a little bit tricky here. I was just waiting until after to show you this. There's one more bit of code that's required to make that demo work. And you have to do this thing called register property. And the reason that you can't animate custom properties today is because the browser doesn't know what type they are. A custom property could be anything. It's just a token stream. So you, know, you can't animate like red to you know, 100% or something. It, it, it just doesn't work and the browser doesn't know what to do with it. But when you register the property and you pass it the name and you pass it the syntax, so in this case, you know, it's a number, 
the radius was a number and um, the other one was a color, now the browser knows how to animate it. And this is super powerful. If you think about a site where you have custom properties specify the theme, and then maybe you, know, you have a light theme and a dark theme, and then in your web app you detect that you know, um, the ambient light in the room has changed, you could change the, pro the custom property, transition it, and the, the entire site would slowly like, fade from like, the dark version to the light version. And you wouldn't have to animate like, a bazillion selectors, you would just animate a, a couple of properties. So it's really powerful. So again, these are some cool demos, but you might wonder what is this, how does this relate to, to polyfilling? Well, you can use these Houdini APIs to kind of recreate standard features. So take conic gradients, gradients, for example. This is a feature that developers have been asking for a long time. Support recently landed in Chrome Canary, but this is a great example of something that you could polyfill with Houdini. So it's just a background image, so you could um, you know, register a conic gradient worklet, and you, you know, would just kind of implement this yourself. And uh, this demo, I used uh, Leia Veru's conic gradient polyfill, which she does kind of using a lot of the same techniques that I described before, which, you know, don't perform super well. I took that code and just took the canvas bit of it and re-implemented it here. And so this is, you know, an example of background paint painting a conic gradient. And I know this is going to get old real fast, but Again, we can go into DevTools, and I can change this, and because it's just CSS, it works. You know, and I can animate you know, the, the, you know, the color stops where they appear in DevTools as well. So like Leia Veru's polyfill, for example, n no fault of her own, she couldn't animate these things. Like once you have the, the background image, it's kind of there forever. But with these Houdini APIs, because it's all CSS, you can just you can animate things nicely. And so, you know, a couple more demos. You can do things like a color wheel. Uh, you could do, you know, a pie chart if you wanted to. Also, all the cool things that you can do with conic gradients, you can do with this paint function that I created. And so, you might also be thinking, okay, but that's still not really a polyfill. You're just using a new API. You're not using the conic gradient function. Like a real polyfill, you don't use. This other thing, you use the standard feature and then it just works. But this, this still is possible, you know, so you do this probably all the time today. I, I assume almost everyone in here uses Auto Prefixer or some kind of post-CSS plugin where you, you give it standards compliant CSS and it automatically creates the fallbacks for you. So in this case, you could create a post-CSS plugin that if it detects conic gradient somewhere, it could continue to use conic gradient in supported browsers and it could use the paint function behind the scenes. Now this isn't quite complete because you also have to you know, um, load the worklet. But with tools like Webpack, which have a more comprehensive, you know, kind of place in the build system, you have loaders, and you could do a similar thing where you have a Houdini loader or whatever polyfill you want it to be, and then Webpack would use post-CSS to load your CSS, inspect it, look for this conic gradient feature. If it finds it, then do what we did in the previous slide where we add the fallback, and then Webpack could also know what snippets of code needed to be added to, um, to the main document to get this all working. So I, I foresee this is how most people will use kind of these Houdini polyfills going forward. You'll just install the loader and it'll just work and you know, you won't have to think too much about it. So, you know, what about features that aren't paint or layout related? Well, you know, I'll briefly go over some of these things um, uh, and I think Tab will talk on some of them tomorrow. These are not, uh, there are no APIs for these yet, but there are things that have been discussed like custom functions, like we talked about random earlier, we could expose APIs that allow you to define a, a random function, and then, and then we wouldn't have to do all the stuff we just did, it would just kind of work. And like you see this now with, with, um, with color functions that are being spec but aren't implemented in all browsers, like darken or lighten or changing the hue. Uh, you could do things like potentially custom pseudo classes, like we have uh, next sibling selectors now, but we don't, or I should say combinators, but we don't have previous sibling, so you could maybe define that yourself. We could do things like custom at rules, where you define you know, this at condition, and then you maybe you know, compare whether the container with custom property is greater than or equal to you know, some value. And this would allow you to do things like potentially container queries, which is like maybe the most requested CSS feature, I would say. Um, and this, combined with a new API called Resize Observer, could 
could really enable this, where um, if you're not familiar with Resize Observer, it allows you to asynchrony, asynchronously monitor the changing of sizes of elements, something that is also a long requested feature on the web. So you could do something like create a new Resize Observer, re um, observe all of the um, components, go to their parent node, and then anytime the components with changes, you just set the custom property on the component, and then now in your, because custom properties inherit, now in your child component, you can compare against the parent size, and this kind of what all potentially could work. So wrapping up here, the main points I, wanna, I want you to take away are that polyfilling CSS today is, is much harder than it should be. It's, it's really unfortunate that it is, but it's quite a bit harder than it should be. And without the ability to polyfill these new features, in CSS, innovation will move at the pace of the slowest adopting browser. And this has kind of been the case in CSS. I mean, it's very common for somebody to come to a conference like this and they'll you know, hear about some brand new CSS feature and they'll think, cool, but I can't use that for 10 years, so I'm gonna forget everything I just learned. Like, that shouldn't be the case. We should be able to learn new things and then use them quickly. Like, this cycle should be much faster. And Houdini, kind of for the first time, makes CSS you know, really extensible. Um, it transfers the ability to innovate from spec authors to web developers. And I think that's gonna be really exciting. Um, web developers have proven over time that they are very, very creative people, and they have come up with lots of really cool things, and I can't wait to see like, what web developers do with these APIs once they're available. And you know, it will enable proper polyfilling like I've described, but it will do a ton of other things as well. You know, like the material design button ripple effect thing, that's probably not something that would ever be in a polyfill because it's probably not gonna be a spec feature, but it's still a cool feature and, and things like that will be really powerful in Houdini. And uh, again, like I definitely recommend checking out Tab's talk because um, he'll talk about some of these other features too. So kind of final thought, developers in the JavaScript community complain a lot about innovation. And like I just said, you don't really hear that in CSS, it's the opposite. And I think that we should really advocate for changing that, and so I think we should try to make CSS fatigue a thing. <laughs> anyway, that's all. Um, again, the, uh, this is how you can contact me. The, the slides are at um, my GitHub slash Philip Walton slash talk, and you can see all the code there, and I think we have uh, time for questions. Yeah, please join me over here. There's something about these bar stools that, I don't know, the way we're sitting here, it's like we're in a boys band or about to bust out an acapella song or something. Do you want to start? I'll, I'll no, follow. No, I'm, I'm good, I'm good. Me too, actually. That was a great talk. Uh, there were a lot of questions on Twitter. Um, mm. Some of them were kind of specific about some of your code examples, so okay. yeah, I think it's better if you'll take a look at those later. Okay. Um, but what's the story uh, when it comes to browser supports for Houdini? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I've uh, had the privilege of attending a lot of the spec meetings for the last couple of quarters, and um, all of the browser vendors are present at these spec meetings, and they're engaged in the conversation, and it seems like there's a lot of interest across all browsers. At the moment, though, in terms of what you can play around with, um, only Chrome Canary with the experimental platform, web platform features flag turned on if you want to actually use the, um, the APIs and see how they, they go. But I definitely would encourage people that were interested in this talk to take a look at the specs and kind of you know, imagine the problems that they face and what they'd like to see and go to GitHub, go to the, you know, the W uh, CSS Working Group GitHub and, and look, at the, look at the specs and, and file issues, make suggestions. I so. suppose the spec is still uh, in early stages, so there is, like, there is no polyfill for this polyfill, <laughs> basically. Sure, uh, so there, there's a variety of specs. Um, certain specs are more along than others. Like the, uh, the custom paint one that I showed is I believe in candidate recommendations, so it's kind of very mature, and some of the other ones are just you know, an explainer doc in the GitHub readme. So, so this is kind of a grand vision, and uh, it's gonna be implemented in piecemeal, but uh, yeah, but it's not, you know, there are definitely very concrete specs out there that are being implemented right now. I kind of like the idea of explaining existing functionality by using Houdini APIs. Like for example, could we think of a display grid as a layout feature, like a, the layout function that you showed? Absolutely, so one of the goals uh, of Houdini is effectively make 
Like Houdini will be a success if every existing CSS feature could be re-implemented using Houdini APIs. And that's the ultimate goal. And so in theory, yes, you should be able to write your own grid layout. And, and that's kind of the idea. If you find that maybe, um, I, I don't think this is the case with grid, but with Flexbox, there's a lot of browser inconsistencies. And so maybe you want to replace, maybe, maybe for your site, you can't, these inconsistencies just don't work. So you write your own flexible box model layout Houdini API, and, and then it works cross-browser for your site. Yeah, you used to do a lot of research on Flexbox back in the day, right? Yeah, I've done some research on Flexbox. Yeah, can you talk about some of the projects you were working on back then? Um, well, so I have a, a project called Flexbugs, which is, uh, <laughs> um, which I don't maintain as well as I should. But initially it was, yeah, it was just from, from my, when I was first implementing Flexbox on, on my website, I noticed all of these issues cross browser and you know, I spent way too much time trying to, trying to fix those. And so I thought, yeah, everyone else should be able to learn these lessons. Really, I just did it so that I, when I came back like a year later and you know, I, I, I was basically writing down what I found out. Uh, another question from Twitter is, are registered page operations cached and fast or will they significantly slow down page performance? That's a great question. Um, it's just an HTTP request like anything else. So, you know, uh, I actually don't know if it, I assume it appears in the HTTP cache. I, I'm not 100% sure. I see no reason why it wouldn't. Um, you know, I think moving to it, like by the time Houdini APIs are fully supported, presumably H2 will also be fully supported and things like server push will be worked out to a greater degree. So I'm not too worried about having these things depend upon a request to a JavaScript file. Um, I, I, I think that will be a mostly solved problem by that time, but you know, I can't say for sure. I think another way of looking at this question is um, if, you read, like if you use these Houdini APIs to register your own function, so to say, um, is there room for optimization on the browser's end? Because we tell the browser what to do, is it, would it be better than writing a polyfill uh, the other way, like the bad way that you showed for other reasons? Yeah, I mean, I suppose when you you know, take over these APIs, you kind of become the person re responsible for the optimizations. I mean, I think certain optimizations will always be able to be made by the browser, but in terms of, um, you know, if you're writing your own layout function, I would, I would assume you have to be responsible for right. making sure it works, it runs efficiently. Right, so use with caution, basically. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your talk. Please sure. give him a warm hand.